Good evening, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome here tonight to hear this public Bible lecture entitled Fulfilled Bible Prophecy, Sufficient Evidence to Believe in God. And we hope that you find the, the things we consider tonight to be interesting, challenging and informative. And we're going to turn our attention firstly to an introductory reading of Isaiah 44, beginning at verse 24, and reading through to Isaiah 45, verse 7. Introduction to our subject for this evening, Fulfilled Bible Prophecy, Sufficient Evidence to Believe in God. And we'll invite our speaker, Mr Shimon Spina, to address you. Thanks, Phil, and good evening, everyone. It's good to spend this evening with you to share some time around this very important topic of fulfilled Bible prophecy. So as the title suggests, we want to look at sufficient evidence to believe in God. Not absolute, it's sufficient. I can't show you God, and if that's what you require to believe, something as absolute as that, then you won't be convinced. But what we hope to do tonight is to show you sufficient evidence to give you very good reason to believe in God. So what does the Bible say about prophecy? It says, we have a more sure word of prophecy. Whereunto you do well that you take heed, as unto a light that shineth in a dark place, until the day dawn and the day star rise in your hearts. Knowing this first, that no prophecy of the scripture is of any private interpretation. For the prophecy came not in old time by the will of man, but holy men of God spake as they were moved by the Holy Ghost. In a more modern translation, it says, we have something more sure. The more sure is the prophetic word. That is what is more sure. To which you do well to pay attention as to a lamp shining in a dark place. If you or I are in a dark place, we desire light, don't we, to show us where to go. Knowing this, first of all, that no prophecy of Scripture comes from someone's own interpretation. This is not my private interpretation. This is not your private interpretation. Scripture says that prophecy, the word of prophecy, is God's interpretation, not an individual's. And so the Apostle Peter here in this verse says that you should pay attention to prophecy because they are prophecies of God. And it's through looking at these prophecies that we can see whether they have come to pass. And therefore, if the Bible is true, and by extension, whether God exists. So tonight we hope to look at two prophecies in the Bible that have been fulfilled, which will start to form our case for our title, that there is sufficient evidence to believe, and that sufficient evidence is fulfilled Bible prophecies. And therefore, that we have sufficient re reason to start looking at the Bible as something we can trust in relation to other things it talks about, in relation to, to other prophecies about God's future plan with the earth and God's future plan with mankind. So the two prophecies we hope to look at tonight are the prophecies of Cyrus and Israel. The first prophecy is about a man named Cyrus who was king of Persia in the 6th century BC. And the prophet Isaiah writes about him in Isaiah 45, 44 and 45, as we had read tonight. And we're going to see that this prophecy was fulfilled exactly as was written in the Bible. And not only as was what was written in the Bible, but we will see that history and archaeology prove this prophecy. And that therefore the Bible is reliable. It can be trusted. That, that God is real that we can trust what he has said about other things in the Bible that are yet to come to pass on the earth. And the second prophecy we want to look at is about the nation of Israel, taken from Ezekiel 37. It's a far more modern prophecy. 
one that was fulfilled in the past hundred years, despite being written over two and a half thousand years ago. So they're the two prophecies we want to look at. But firstly, we have to lay down a, a foundation principle of the Bible. The Bible claims to be written by God. In 2 Timothy 3, verses 15 to 17, we read, All scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be perfect, truly furnished unto all good works. And we believe this. We, we believe that the Bible is inspired, that the Bible is written by God, that it's useful for providing moral guidance in life. And by going through these prophecies tonight, I think you'll see that we don't believe this claim of the Bible being written by God without good reason. There's very good reason to believe it, and fulfilled Bible prophecy is one of those reasons. So in the prophecy of Cyrus, we see an immense amount of accuracy. So accurate that an individual's name is mentioned, and exactly what he would do is foretold around 160 years before it happened. Now, Isaiah 40, 45 verse 4, it makes the point of naming him even though Cyrus himself didn't know God. So God knew Cyrus. God knew what Cyrus was going to do. He had prophesied what Cyrus was going to do. And it didn't matter that Cyrus didn't even know God. Now, think about this in practical terms. Could you or anyone you know predict who is going to be the President of the United States in 160 years' time? Yeah, maybe you could predict the next President. Maybe you could look at stats. You could look at current popularity. And you might be able to predict who, who would be the next President of the United States. But you wouldn't be certain, would you? Well, what about at 160 years? Try and give that a go. It's not something easy we are talking about. This is something which, from, a, from man's perspective, is impossible. Predicting what's going to happen, who the individual's going to, going to be, what he's going to do in 160 years' time. And as we go through this prophecy, keep in mind how unique this is. It's, it's a detailed prophecy about someone in the world Mentioning his name, mentioning his position, mentioning the unique way, we're going to say it's very unique, the unique way he would conquer a nation. The decree he would make about the nation of Israel. All foreseen and all prophesied by God 160 years before it occurred. That's an exceptional prophecy. One that you and I can't do, but which God can. So the prophecy of Cyrus... Well, Isaiah wrote these words around 700 BC. And the king of Persia, Cyrus, who Isaiah prophesies about, didn't, didn't become king and didn't fulfill what's written in Isaiah 44 and 45 until 539 BC, around 160 years later. So what did Isaiah prophesy about Cyrus? As we've read tonight in our reading, it, Isaiah prophesies that Cyrus would come to power and conquer and rule the nations around him that he would free captive Jews, that he would decree Jerusalem to be built, and that he would decree that the temple in Jerusalem be built. But firstly, I guess we, we need to show that Isaiah wrote this prophecy around 160 years before Cyrus took Babylon. Because as I mentioned, history tells us that Cyrus took Babylon in 539 BC. That was one of the, one of the nations, one of the cities he took. How do we know that Isaiah wrote Isaiah 44 and 45 160 years beforehand? Well, I think the following quotes, which show that King Hezekiah of Jerusalem, Sennacherib, king of Assyria, and the prophet Isaiah were all alive at the same time will help us. We've got those three quotes there. In the 14th year of King Hezekiah, Sennacherib, king of Assyria, came up against the fenced cities of Judah. 2 Chronicles 32 Thus saith Sennacherib, king of Assyria, wherein do ye trust and ye abide in the siege of Jerusalem? And chapter 32, verse 20, And for this cause Hezekiah the king and the prophet Isaiah, the son of Amos, prayed and cried to heaven. So there we have it, the prophet Isaiah, Hezekiah and Sennacherib all together. It shows that they're alive at the same time. 
But we still have to show that this is 160 years before Cyrus. This is around 700 BC. So, so that's what we need to show. Well, this here is Sennacherib's prison. It was disco discovered among the ruins of the ancient city of the Assyrian Empire. And it was written by King Sennacherib. And the experts tell us it was written around 700 BC. And he records the siege of Jerusalem and of King Hezekiah, which we just read in the previous slide in 2 Chronicles and 2 Kings. And what does he write? This is what he writes. As for Hezekiah the Judah, who did not submit to my yoke, 46 of his strong walled cities I besieged and took them. That's what we read two slides back in 2 Kings chapter 18, that he would take fenced cities. That was exactly what the Bible wrote. And this is written on Sennacherib's prison. Hezekiah, like a caged bird, I shut up in Jerusalem, his royal city. That's what we read in 2 Chronicles 32, two slides ago. So in 2 Chronicles, we had Isaiah mentioned with Hezekiah and Sennacherib. And archaeological findings prove this was in 700 BC. And Cyrus didn't take Babylon for another 160 years. Which we'll prove in a minute by records and archaeological findings. So Isaiah, along with Hezekiah and Sennacherib, lived well before Cyrus, during the time of Sennacherib and prophesied of the coming of Cyrus and what he would do 160 years later. So now that we have the time of Isaiah's writing established, we need to have a look at Cyrus. And we're going to go through his life and see the things he did and how he did them, and how un unknowingly at the time, at least to start with, he fulfilled this prophecy about him in Isaiah 44 and 45. So in around 600 BC, Cyrus is born. And his father, Cambyses, was king of the western part of Persia. And the Greek historian Herodotus, who lived in the 5th century BC, he records how when Cyrus was a baby, he escaped being killed by, by his grandfather, who had a dream which supposedly told him that Cyrus was going to try and overtake him and become king. However, the official that was appointed the task of killing young Cyrus spared the child's life and gave him to a shepherd and the shepherd's wife who raised him. That's a story, that's a, that's a historical record of Cyrus. And so Cyrus was raised as a shepherd. And it's in that that we commence seeing the fulfilment of Isaiah 44 and 45 being fulfilled. Because in Isaiah chapter 44 verse 28, what do we read? It is I who saith of Cyrus, he is my shepherd. He will perform all my pleasure. So Isaiah alludes to, to this early stage in Cyrus's life. He was raised as a shepherd. Well, history tells us that when Cyrus was 40, after his father's death, he revolts against his grandfather's kingdom, the kingdom of Media. And he proclaimed himself as king of the Medes and the Persians. And in one grand stroke, Cyrus became master from the Mediterranean Sea the Iranian plateau and Cyrus gathered his army of Medes and Persians and it didn't take him long to gain control of all of Asia Minor so Cyrus took three of the four great empires of the world in his day these being the empires of Media Lydia and Babylon and guess what this fulfills exactly what God said in Isaiah 45 verses 1 and 2 this is what the Lord says to his anointed, to Cyrus, whose right hand I take hold of, to subdue nations before him and to strip kings of their armour. I will go before thee and make the crooked places straight. The crooked places straight. It's, it's a symbol of how far Cyrus took one nation after the other. The ease and the speed at which he did it. How? Because God was supporting him. God was helping Cyrus, as we read in Isaiah 45. Because God was causing this prophecy to be fulfilled. That's how Cyrus was able to conquer such a phenomenal amount of time, uh, amount of land, 
in such a short amount of time. It's an amazing feat that he achieved. Historians will tell us that. And he clearly did fulfill what Isaiah prophesied. Now, historical records tell us that Babylon was the primary empire ruling the then known world before Cyrus conquered it and became the ruling king. And it's this conquering of Babylon by Cyrus that we're now going to look at in which Isaiah 45, our reading for tonight, is talking about. Well, firstly, what do we know about Babylon? Babylon was the most powerful and prominent city in the land of Assyria in the mid-600 BC. It had one of the seven wonders of the ancient world there, the Hanging Gardens of Babylon, which archaeologists have discovered. Historians tell us that the land of Assyria possessed a great number of cities. And they tell us that the strongest and most well-known city was Babylon. They tell us that the city walls were up to 20 metres wide and up to 90 metres tall. They tell us that it was defended by water moats and 250 watchtowers. Now this is the city that Isaiah predicted Cyrus would take. Not just any city, this was the prominent city of the then known world. An extremely powerful and well defence city which was pretty much impenetrable. But this city was going to be overtaken by Cyrus. And it's by looking at how he did this that we'll continue to see the many ways in which he would fulfil this prophecy of Isaiah in detail. Okay, so Cyrus has taken the whole of Asia Minor. And now in 539 BC, as the historical records tell us, he comes against Babylon. And ancient, reputable historians, as Herodotus, Barossus, and Xenophon, they record the story of how Cyrus took Babylon. And you've got it there, you've got an extract there on the screen. He placed a regiment of his troops at a certain spot where the river enters the city. He placed troops at the back end where the river exits. And he ordered them to, to get into the city as, as soon as the river dropped down, the level dropped down, it became shallow enough for, the, for them to cross over. And then what he did with his Persian army, they, they then diverted the, the river Euphrates because the river ran through the city, as you can see in those, um, those images there. The river ran through the city. And so what Cyrus did is he, he diverted the river. And as soon as the river went down, as soon as it was shallow enough, the Persian army could go straight under the gates and into the city. And, and notice the words that the, historians, that the historians use. At this moment, the Persian army that was left behind at Babylon entered the stream, when it was low enough, and made their way into the city of Babylon by the channel of the Euphrates. Had the Babylonians been aware of what Cyrus was up to, they could have kept the Persians from entering the city, for they would have closed all the street gates which overlooked the river, and from atop the walls along both sides of the waterway would have caught their enemy off guard in a trap. The town was not aware what had taken place, for they were engaged in a festival of dancing and revelry. This was the account of how Babylon was first. And not only do historians say this, there have been archaeological findings which, which prove this to be the case beyond all doubt, that this is, this is actually what happened. First, we've got an artefact which is called Cyrus's cylinder. And Cyrus himself wrote on this clay cylinder, and he recorded how he conquered Babylon. This is what Cyrus wrote. Without engaging the enemy, we were able to enter Babylon without battle and conflict. Into my hands, Nabonidus was delivered, the king who did not worship me. And the second artifact, the chronicle of Nabonidus. He was the king of Babylon at the time when Cyrus defeated his city. And this is what he writes. The governor of and the army of Cyrus entered Babylon without battle. In the month, Arasana, Cyrus entered Babylon. Scant on detail, of course, because this is the record of his defeat. He doesn't want to give too much detail, does he? But he records the event. He says what happened. So that's, that's the historical, from the historians, Herodotus and others, and the archaeologically proven record of what happened. Did you see how it fitted perfectly with what the Bible said would happen through, through Isaiah, the words that he had prophesied 160 years beforehand? Isaiah 44, verse 27. 
that saith to the deep, Be dry, and I will dry up thy rivers. Cyrus dried up the river, the river Euphrates, by, by diverting it. So he and his army could walk straight into the city. Isaiah 45 verse 1, To open before him the two leaved gates. With the river dried up, Cyrus walked right under the entry gates to Babylon. And from the inside, they could be opened, couldn't they? Isaiah 45 verse 1 again. And the gates shall not be shut. Yeah, once he, once he got through the entrance gates, once he got through the entrance gates, he, he continued through the open street gates. And there's an image there which displays how the, how the city looked. You get in the entry gates and then all the street gates. And through, through all the open street gates. That's what it says in Isaiah 45 verse 1. And that's what historians said happened. That, that the street gates would not be shut. So the historical record matches with the biblical record. Even though the biblical record was written 160 years before it happened. And so as I said, that, that image there just gives an idea as to how the river was diverted. And so under the gates went the enemy. And through the open street gates on either side of the channel. And into the city proper without opposition. And also one minor addition to this is that the historians tell us in their records that this great city of Babylon had hundreds of brass gates, hundreds of them. So again, another link to Isaiah, this time chapter 45, verse 2. I will break in pieces the gates of brass and cut in sunder the bars of iron. So these historical records from renowned historians and, there's, and these archaeological artefacts prove what Isaiah prophesied. And that amazingly, it wouldn't be like most other battles. This was going to be very unique. It wasn't going to be two armies battling it out on the battlefield until one, one conquered the other. But that it would involve diverting a river, entering through, open, entering through gates, unopposed. It wasn't some generic prophecy that people could apply to anything. It was very specific to show that this prophecy was not created by man. Only God is capable of making such a prophecy 160 years before it came to pass. But it doesn't end there. Let's continue with the story. In 537, Cyrus allowed more than 40,000 Jews to leave Babylon and to return to Palestine. Cyrus also records this in his cylinder. To the sacred cities located on the other side of the Tigris River, I sent back to the ruins of their holy places the articles which were used in their sanctuaries. I also allowed to return to their homes the former citizens of the land. I also made an effort to repair their dwelling places. That's what Cyrus wrote he did. Now that's amazing. That, that's, that's history recording what Cyrus did to the Jews who, who were slaves under the king of Babylon. That, that when he conquered the city, he let them go free. He let them return to the, their homeland. He, he even gave back the temple artifacts that they could set up in their temple again. He helped them recommence building the temple. And then, and then Cyrus also starts to repair and re, rebuild their dwelling places. And what, it, what had Isaiah prophesied 160 years beforehand? Well, exactly that. Isaiah 44, verse 28. That saith of Cyrus, he's my shepherd and, and shall perform all my pleasure. Even saying to Jerusalem, thou shalt be built and to the temple, thy foundation shall be laid. In Isaiah 45, verse 13. He shall build my city. He shall let go my captives. Not for price, not for reward, saith the Lord of hosts. So not only would he let the captives go, but also it was recorded that he wouldn't do it for, for any financial benefit to himself. Yes, yeah, Cyrus let them go, and he gave back the temple treasure for nothing. It was God in control. And Cyrus was simply a tool that God was using to fulfill his prophecy. And what he, what's even more amazing is that when Isaiah wrote these words... When he wrote this prophecy in 700 BC that, that Cyrus would come and rebuild Jerusalem and send the captives, <coughs> captives back, 
the temple, the city, they, they still existed. They, they hadn't even been destroyed yet. Jerusalem wasn't destroyed by Nebuchadnezzar, the king of Babylon, until 587 BC. So, so the, the people of the time that were listening to and reading Isaiah's prophecies, they were getting a double prophecy. They were hearing Isaiah saying, this city, it's going to be rebuilt. But it was already there. So they knew that, well, so it's going to be destroyed first. And then it's going to be rebuilt under Cyrus in 160 years' time. Why did Cyrus do this? It just seems strange. Yeah, none of the other kings did anything like this. Yeah, when a nation was conquered, all the treasures were taken and used by the new king. The inhabitants were used as slaves. The whole nation was forced to worship the new king normally. And the new king's, new king's God and religion as well. But not with Cyrus. He did things which were extremely unique. And the simple reason why is because God was using him to fulfill prophecies made by Isaiah 160 years earlier. And that's why Isaiah 44 says, verses, verse 28, that thus saith the Lord to his anointed, to Cyrus. So Cyrus was his anointed. Cyrus was, was the individual that God was using. Isaiah 45, verse 1 says that Seth of Cyrus, he is my shepherd and shall perform all my pleasure. He did it simply because God was using him. Very, very unique events and, and unique things that Cyrus did purely because God was using him to fulfill this prophecy. So that's the prophecy of Cyrus in a nutshell. No vague terms at all like you may have heard in other prophecies that people claim have been fulfilled but very specific detail, very specific terms which were prophesied 160 years beforehand by the prophet Isaiah. And which we've seen, it's, it's not just in the Bible, they're in historical accounts, they're, they're proven by archaeological findings. And this is what God says of himself in regard to prophecies like this. This is what God says. Remember the former things of old, for I am God and there is no other. I am God and there is none like me. What does God do? He declares the end from the beginning and from ancient times things not yet done, saying, My counsel shall stand and I will accomplish all my pleasure, all my purpose. Calling a bird of prey from the east, the man of my counsel from a far country, I have spoken, says God, and I will bring it to pass. I have purposed and I will do it. That's what God says about declaring the end from the beginning. Prophecies that he controls. So why do we have this prophecy of Cyrus in such detail? 160 years beforehand. Because it's evident that humans can't do it, but that God can. And, he, and, he, and that's exactly his claim. He claims to do this. And the fact that it's happened exactly as prophesied proves to us that God does exist. He's at work, he's controlling history, he's controlling destiny. God is real, he controls the future. I think this is sufficient evidence to believe in the existence of God. The other prophecy we'll have a very quick look at is about the nation of Israel. So let's flick across to Ezekiel chapter 37, verses 1 to 14. So let's just, let's just quickly read Ezekiel 37, verses 1 to to 14. The hand of the Lord was upon me and carried me out in the spirit of the Lord and set me down in the midst of the valley which was full of bones and caused me to pass by them round about and behold there were very many in the open valley and lo they were very dry and he said unto me son of man can these bones live and I answered O Lord God thou knowest Again, he said unto me, prophesy upon these bones and say unto them, O ye dry bones, hear the word of the Lord. Thus saith the Lord God unto these bones, behold, I will cause breath to enter into you and ye shall live. And I will lay sinews upon you and will bring up flesh upon you and cover you with skin and put breath in you and ye shall live and ye shall know that I am the Lord. So I prophesied as I was commanded. And as I prophesied, there was a noise, and behold, a shaking, and the bones came together, bone to his bone. 
And when I beheld, lo, the sinews and the flesh came up upon them, and the skin covered them above, but there was no breath in them. Then said he unto me, Prophesy unto the wind, prophesy, son of man, and say to the wind, Thus saith the Lord God, Come from the four winds, O breath, and breathe upon these slain, that they may live. So I prophesied as he commanded me, and the breath came into them, and they lived and stood up upon their feet, an ex exceeding great army. And he said unto me, Son of man, these bones are the whole house of Israel. Behold, they say, our bones are dried, and our hope is lost. We are cut off for our parts. Therefore prophesy and say unto them, Thus saith the Lord God, Behold, O my people, I will open your graves, and cause you to come out of your graves, and bring you into the land of Israel. And ye shall know that I am the Lord, when I have opened your graves, O my people, and brought you up out of your graves. Put my spirit in you, and ye shall live, and I, shall place in you your own, and I will place you in your own land. Then shall ye know that I, the Lord, have spoken it, and performed it. Thus saith the Lord. So Ezekiel prophesied this prophecy around 590 to 570 BC, over two and a half thousand years ago. And what I find incredible with this prophecy is that yeah, even if critics disagree with when it was written, they might argue the timing and try to, try to argue that, that it was written far later, it still doesn't affect the power of this prophecy. Because this prophecy is before the events of May 1948 when Israel became a nation again in the last 70 years. And absolutely everyone knows that the Bible has been around and it was written way, way, way before then. Two and a half thousand years ago is when it was written. And in verse 1 we read that the prophet Ezekiel receives a vision from God and it starts with a valley of very dry bones in verse 2. Very dry bones. It's something dead, something that has been dead for a long time. Fresh bones, they're quite moist, aren't they? Dry bones, they've been dead a long time. So, so God is talking through Ezekiel about something that's been dead a very long time. And there's no ambiguity in this prophecy, absolutely no ambiguity at all as to who this prophecy is prophesying about. What do we read in verse 11? They are, these bones, the, these very dry bones, they are the whole house, the whole nation of Israel. So very simply, this, this is a prophecy about Israel. So, so very quickly, let, let's, just, let's just look at the history, the start of the nation of Israel. Well, the history of Israel starts with a man called Abraham in Genesis chapter 12. And we're going to flick through these verses very quickly. Starts with a man by the name of Abraham in Genesis chapter 12 and God makes him this man a promise in Genesis chapter 12 he says now the Lord had said to Abraham get out of your country from your family and from your father's house to a land that I will show you and I will make you a great nation this is the promise that God has made to this man Abraham in verse 5 he says and into the land of Canaan they came so the land of Canaan is what is the area of modern day Israel in the surrounding areas. So, so God speaks to Abraham in Genesis chapter 12 and he says, look, come out of the land that you're in and come to the land that I'm going to show you, the land of Canaan. And I'm going to make you a great nation, Abraham. That's what God says to Abraham. And it continues in Genesis chapter 13. The Lord said to Abraham, or Abram, lift your eyes now, look from the place where you are, Look to the north, to the south, to the east, to the west. For all the land which you see I will give to you and your descendants forever. In the second highlighted blue section, Abram, get up, walk in the land through its length and its width, for I will give it to you. So that's a promise that God's making to Abraham, to Abram. And it continues in Genesis chapter 15. 
where God says again to Abraham, to your descendants I have given this land from the, from the river of Egypt to the great river, the river Euphrates. So we now starting to define a specific area, aren't we? It's clearly what is today the land of Israel and the surrounding areas. The promises continue in Genesis chapter 17. Also, I will give to you and your descendants after you the land in which you are a stranger, all the land of Canaan. Temporarily? No. As an everlasting possession, and I will be their God. So that's the start of the nation. What's going to become, we're going to show you, it becomes the nation of Israel. God's promise to a man named Abraham. And what do we have two generations later? Well, Abraham had a son called Isaac, and Isaac had a son called Jacob. And Jacob's name is changed by God to Israel. He was Jacob, he becomes Israel. And God said, your name shall no longer be called Jacob, but Israel, in Genesis chapter 32. And then Jacob had 12 sons. And they were called the children of Israel. And they were the start of the nation of Israel. The great nation, which if you recall, a few slides ago, God promised to Abraham in Genesis chapter 12. I will make of you a great nation. Jacob changed Israel. Israel has 12 sons. It is the start of the nation of Israel. And throughout the history of the nation of Israel, we see a repetitive cycle. We see Israel, the nation of Israel, arriving in the promised land. We see them driven out by hardship. And then we see them return under miraculous circumstances. Time and time again, we see this repetitive cycle. In Genesis chapter 12, we have Abraham in the promised land. He's then driven out. In Genesis chapter 46, we read that he and his family have to go to Egypt. <coughs> we then see in the biblical record that there's an exodus. And, they, and then Israel returns to the promised land. But after some time in the land of Israel, they're then taken captive by the Babylonians. But then after that, we see that Babylon is overthrown. We've seen that earlier tonight in the prophecy of Cyrus. Cyrus overthrew Babylon. And he sent the Jews back to the land of Israel. So Israel have returned to the promised land again. And then in AD 70, Israel again was driven out of the land. And the question is, when would they return? When would Israel be in the promised land again? Would, would, they, would they ever return? Because the latest driving out, of, the latest time they were driven out of the land of Israel was in AD 70, and that was intense. It, after a period of Jewish revolt, the Romans went into Jerusalem and destroyed the temple. They, they basically destroyed Israel. That they, they made it so Israel as a nation ceased to exist. Jews fled to the surrounding countries and the Romans renamed the land Palestine. And from then the land, what used to be the land of Israel, now called Palestine, that land passed through several hands. You had the Roman, the Byzantine rule, the Arabic rule, eventually the Turkish rule, until in World War I the British forces defeated the Turks. And they maintained military rule from 1917 to 1922. And then the League of Nations awarded Britain the mandate to govern Palestine, as it had been called. Israel had ceased to exist. The nation of Israel was no more. And after World War II, with, with the Nazi ideology, Hitler tried to exterminate the Jews, didn't he? And with that, the move for a Jewish homeland reached its highest peak. And on May 15, 1948, guess what came back into existence? The state of Israel was born again. A miracle. After nearly 1900 years, the nation of Israel had been destroyed, their, their homeland taken away. They'd have been scattered 
throughout the world. The land had been renamed to Palestine. Yet never before in the history of the world had a nation ceased to exist and then come back into existence. Yet this happened despite the Holocaust, despite immense unrest in the area with all the other Arab na nations around them, their neighbours, refusing a two-state state solution that was proposed. And after being newly formed, the Arab nations around united and attacked Israel, which Israel miraculously won against incredible odds. Well, all of this was predicted by the Bible in Ezekiel 37. Obviously, Ezekiel 36 is the prelude to the prophecy in Ezekiel 37. And in Ezekiel 36, it speaks about how Israel would be dead for many years and then return again. In Ezekiel 36, verses 20, or 16 to 20, which you can read in detail in your own time, God says that, that his people had been incredibly dis disobedient to him and that because of that they would be scattered throughout the world, scattered throughout other countries and that they would have the unfortunate legacy of being known to have been expelled from their homeland by their God. And in Ezekiel 36 verses 21 and onwards, God says that, that despite this, despite their disobedience, because of who God is, because of his character, and the promises that he had made to them, to their forefather Abraham in Genesis 12, 13, 15, because of that, he would restore them again in the sight of the world. And he would re-establish them in the land of Israel. Let's read Ezekiel 36, verses 21 to 24, where we read this. But I, talking of God, had pity for my holy name, which the house of Israel had profaned among the heathen, whither they went. Therefore say unto the house of Israel, Thus saith the Lord God, I do not this for your sakes, O house of Israel, but for mine holy name's sake, which ye have profaned among the heathen, whither ye went. And I will sanctify my great name, which was profaned among the heathen, which ye have profaned in the midst of them. And the heathen shall know that I am the Lord, saith the Lord God, when I shall be sanctified in you before their eyes. For I will take you from among the heathen and gather you out of all countries and will bring you into your own land. Israel's existence, Israel's re-existence, becoming a nation again in these verses is testament is testament to and evidence of God working with them. It's evidence of God's existence. And so we come to Ezekiel 37. And as we mentioned earlier, Ezekiel 37 was a prophecy written two and a half thousand years before the events of May 1948 when Israel became a nation again. And we mentioned that, the, that Ezekiel, the prophet, was taken to, to a valley of very dry bones. They'd been dead a long time, 1900 years. And God tells him to prophesy about these bones and to say, gather the bones from, from, from the four winds. So that the bones that now regather to, to be bodies might become living beings again. And as we read, the interpretation is given very, very clearly in verses 11 to 14. It's unambiguous. It's absolutely clear. You, no one, you, you can't debate with it. He said to me, son of man, these bones are the whole house of Israel. They indeed say our bones are dry, our hope is lost, and we ourselves are cut off. You know, the, the, the nation was dead. It had been dead. But God says, I'll bring you into the land of Israel. I'll place you in your own land. And then you will know that I, the Lord, have spoken it and performed it. So what? Why would you and I care? Well, as we saw, God promised Abraham that his children would inherit the land forever, didn't he? 
And despite many ups and downs, Israel have always been drawn back to land. Yes, they've been, they've been taken out, but they've always come back. And in recent history, events that the Bible predicted would happen, events that the Bible predicted would happen two, two and a half thousand years ago, they've happened before our very own eyes. Some of us were alive in 1948. And this is one of the many Bible proofs that the Bible is real and that it contains God's true message of salvation. And that message of salvation is not just for Israel. This is a message which is applicable to you and I. Salvation has come to the Gentiles, Paul says in Romans 11. That's you and I, Gentiles. We're not Jews, we're Gentiles. Anyone that's not a Jew. You being a wild olive tree were crafted in among them, among Israel. The Apostle Paul says that this Jewish hope is open to us, to us Gentiles. And in Galatians chapter 3, we're told that we can be Abraham's children. Where it says in the scripture for seeing that God would justify the Gentiles, you and I, by faith, he preached the gospel to Abraham beforehand. What did he say to him? In you all the nations shall be blessed. So then those who are of faith are blessed with faithful or believing Abraham. Now to Abraham and his seed were the promises made. He didn't say and to seeds, plural. But he said to your seed as one. To your seed who is Christ. Here in Galatians 3 the Apostle Paul is explaining those verses that we read in Genesis 12, 13, 15, 17. And the Apostle Paul is saying, oh, you, you know that promise? The promise that God made to Abraham? It's actually a promise that was pointing forward to the Lord Jesus Christ. That was, that was a seed that was being referred to in Genesis chapter 12. And in Galatians chapter 3, verses 26 to 29, the Apostle Paul continues. For you are all sons of God through faith in Christ Jesus. He's talking to believers. For as many of you as were baptised into Christ have put on Christ. There's neither Jew nor Greek. There's neither slave nor free. There's neither male nor female. You are all one in Christ Jesus. And if you are Christ's, then ye are Abraham's seed and heirs according to the promise. So, so through faith in Jesus Christ, through baptism, you and I can be part of of that promise to Abraham. You and I can be part of that seed, that generation, that descendancy of Abraham. And we can inherit the promise that was given to him. To inherit the land, the land of Israel, forever. So they are just two of many fulfilled Bible prophecies written in scripture. It's sufficient evidence to believe in God. And as we saw, the Bible claims to be written by God. Yes, there's lots more to cover. Yes, there are even some confusing, some, some difficult parts to the Bible. But fulfilled Bible prophecy is one of the greatest evidences, and, and there are many others, that give us the confidence and the rationale to believe in the existence of God. So if God exists, if he's in control... Surely we should be responding by spending time trying, trying to figure out who he is. Trying to figure out what he wants from you and me. And the Bible teaches that his ultimate plan is to fill the earth with people that reflect his perfect character. And this is actually going to be part of, of the next big prophecy which God is in control of, which God is going to fulfill soon. The return of the Lord Jesus Christ to the earth. To set up God's kingdom on the earth. And to reward those who have believed in him, who have been baptised and who are trying to live a life following his example. But that's the subject of another lecture, one which I'm sure the Christadelphians would be happy to invite you to if you'd express their interest to them. So fulfilled Bible prophecy. It's something we need to listen to, we need to take heed to in the words of the Apostle Peter in 2 Peter 1. I hope, like you, or like me, that you are convinced that fulfilled Bible prophecy is sufficient evidence 
to believe in God.